if we could free up our time for doing the stuff in infrastructure that we want to be doing, developing some sort of platform that automates most of the cycle yep. is generally where you start heading towards, right? So time for you, the, the platform engineer say, here is something you can go and fill in the valleys you want. Okay, great. It's going to go make all the stuff you need and I can go about my life and you can go about yours. We're going to just... Oh, look at that, that. That worked. Why do organizations build platform team, platform engineering? What's the point of having a platform engineering team in an enterprise? And where does security play a role on this? I had the pleasure of talking to Cole Morrison, who's a senior developer advocate at HashiCorp at HashiConf. Uh, in Boston, and we spoke about the value of a platform team and how does an enterprise scale with a platform team in terms of not just scaling the engineering, but also scaling security. Overall, it was a great conversation. I hope you enjoyed this episode with uh, Cole. And if you know any other enterprise companies that are trying to look into the whole platform space, just to understand what this is about and what unlocking that capability could mean for that organization in terms of automation and just the overall productivity increase that you would find in running large-scale cloud footprint across the organization. If you're watching this on YouTube or LinkedIn, you can show us support for free by subscribing or following us on social media. I hope you enjoy this episode. I'll talk to you next one. Cole, can you share a bit about yourself and what do you do at HashiCorp? So I'm a developer advocate with HashiCorp, but yep. prior to this, been over 10 years of well over because I don't want to give too much age away because I look so, so great. Yeah. yeah. Cloud, DevOps, platform, software engineering. Software engineering was actually my bridge into the whole cloud space. Oh, nice. Started talking about it, teaching it, and then eventually wound up with Hashi when one day I picked up Terraform and was like, oh my God, this is so nice. Yeah. Just, it looks so pleasant. I'll write Jason YAML. And then here we are at HashiCon 2024 in Boston. How many of you said Jason and YAML are being like so awesome? <laughs> no, sorry, not being awesome. It's, it's obviously uh, much more understandable than what it used to before. I feel it allowed more people to enter the space. Obviously, uh, I guess the conversation focus today is both mm -hmm. from an infrastructure perspective as well as uh, the cybersecurity side, mm -hmm. just to lay the groundwork for most people. And I think obviously you have different people at a different scale for mm -hmm. cloud and otherwise as well. Where do you see the infrastructure score integration and the whole platform lifecycle, infrastructure lifecycle? Yeah. How would you describe that to others what an infrastructure lifecycle is and yeah. what is the role of cybersecurity in there? What's really interesting is even though we have this split, I see the ILM side of build, manage, and employ, specifically if you're on Terraform, mm. as where all the security begins. Because it, in essence, since our products like Vault, Boundary, you can configure in Terraform, technically Terraform and infrastructure code is your interface into everything else that you're doing. Mm -hmm. If such is the case, and you say, decide to build a policy, yep. right? You're building that policy in your infrastructure's code. And part of the security aspect of that is not only are you getting the policy enforced across everything, you're getting the, the system of record around the policy, it's usually to where it's being applied, you're getting the ability to apply it again, yep. and you're getting to do it before everything gets deployed, right? Yep. So instead of having thousands upon thousands of resources and the error messages coming back, you have the template, for lack of a better word, that defines all of it, you're monitoring that. Yep. And since we monitor, we lock down before it ever goes out, hey, we're good, right? Yeah, awesome. And I, I think, as you can see, there's a Jenga in front of us. Yeah. And we are testing how great tech people are with Jenga. Yeah. If you can build infrastructure, yeah. like that we, now that we have the infrastructure uh, conversation, yeah. I said how good we are. I'm going to make a move quickly over here. You're going to go like, right. Like I think. <laughs> yeah. Wow, right, you we went have... like right for that. Okay, so I probably shouldn't play too safe, but we'll counterbalance it here. Ooh, all right, cool. So uh, next question for the infrastructure that you've defined now. So obviously we're building an infrastructure stack over here as we do this. From an infrastructure score perspective, what are like the transition different, different companies go through, especially enterprise? Yeah. What are the transitions they go through when they're starting off, say some maybe starting in cloud today? What would be, I guess, some of the initial stages they have to work on? Mm -hmm. And how does it evolve as you go a bit more mature? So interestingly, when you begin in the infrastructure as code in any of our product space, it generally comes down to, especially if you're, if you're in a brownfield environment, it comes down to that sort of quick win, new business function or something that gets blank slated. Hopefully you've done that pattern because beginning with migration of something that's already legacy, that's pretty rough. But you, te you tend to think in that first level of scale, getting code defined for that first environment, and then here we're gonna keep going. Uh, just, to make, just, no, just, to make it, just to make it challenging. Oh, oh that one's not, that one's not stable. Yeah. Oh, that's the whole point. That's yeah. the whole point. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So you tend to, so you tend to, wow, this is making focus on the topic first. <laughs> Very challenging for me here. Um, you tend to have infrastructure 
define in one place, run from by one small team. Yep. You don't have nearly as much policy. You're more concerned with getting things out and put out there. But the longer that you go about, the more, oh, you start, <laughs> the more you start, I know, that was me being very cowardly. The more you start seeing it run across a variety of cloud environments okay. where monitoring and working with it isn't just about concerning yourself in one sandbox, so one AWS account, one GCP project. It's okay, how do we centralize everything? How do we start thinking about instead of managing thousands of members, thousands of code bases, thinking in terms of managing them as a, an ecosystem, a community in one language? And of course that bleeds into security and everything else as well. Trying to, okay, here we go. Oh, wow, you got, I mean, I got. Trying to counterbalance you, because I feel like go. I'm trying All to, right. okay, so if I'm gonna counterbalance, we gotta go here too. Oh, this one's fine. Yeah, there you go. Oh, this is fine. I'm just gonna take down. Oh, a lot of people get confused with the whole platform engineering word. Yeah. A lot of people would have DevOps, they would have uh, mm -hmm. people who are building cloud infrastructure, cloud engineers. Yeah. What is the whole, where, where does it become a platform? Uh, is it the same people as DevOps, or who are these platform engineers? So I, it's one of my pet peeves, the DevOps versus platform engineer. It's because like for a while there, that was what a platform engineer, it was DevOps. But thing that happens is DevOps to yep. me, and I'm gonna state this is my own opinion, that's the skill set. Platform is what you build, therefore you are either a platform engineer if you're working on an internal platform, or you're a DevOps engineer if maybe they just don't know what to call it. Right, yep. because that's yeah. your skill set, right? Yep. You're bridging between the two. The platform is the internal platform upon which all of your applications are running, yep. right? And you tend to have DevOps skill sets because you're doing both development and ops work, right? And you're oh. working on an internal platform of some sort. That one was bold. Now I got to count up the ounces. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be, I'm trying to find one that's, no, that's, that would be evil. Okay, see, this one's safe. Okay. I'm, going, I'm surprised you're going for the safe option. But, so now that we understand what platform is and yeah. where people yeah. want to be talking about focusing their attention on, if you're building a infrastructure as code platform, is the, what is the goal for building a platform? Why not just do what everyone else does, yeah. which is just build some infrastructure as code and keep them in a code base? Why was there yeah. a need for going to the platform? Mainly because you don't want to deal with developers, do you? Do we really want to talk to developers? <laughs> or would we prefer them not send me a ticket ever like that one time? that Greg decided he was gonna ask me to rip out something from Mongo because he didn't know how to manage his application, right? We really don't want to do that. It would be better if we could free up our time for doing the stuff in infrastructure that we wanna be doing, right? Developing some sort of platform that automates most of the cycle yep. is generally where you start heading towards, right? The question was why, right? Yep. Time, right? Time for you, the, the platform engineers say, here is something you can go and fill in the valley as you want. Okay, great, it's gonna go make all the stuff you need and I can go about my life and you can go about yours, right? Yeah. So that's a very extreme version, the self-service side. Sort of the in-between is we make a bunch of reusable building blocks, right? Because yeah. imagine us having to build a full Jenga tower up from just, I don't know, like straight resin. That'd be mm. wild, right? Yeah. Instead, a lot of sensible building blocks such that we can build something up very quickly and know that each one of these building blocks has all the investments of security and policy in them, lets us built rapidly, but still with retaining more customization than a self-service platform. What would be the business use case for it as well? Would you say more from an application perspective over time, does it make it more complex as well? Or is it more the fact that it's a lot more, hey, how do we automate as much so it's self-service driven? Uh, Which do you lean more and more? So, so there's sort of two sides to it, right? There is the efficiency so that you can get out the door. There is the de developer experience that they can just be done with it. But you're asking from the security perspective, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I guess either way, both, both sides, yeah. I feel, as you grow and have more products that are being built with infrastructure as code, does it lead us to a land of, I think in the Lambda world, for people in the self serverless environment, they talk about way too many Lambdas. Yeah. Is there a world of way too many Terraforms? Yeah, no, there's, the world could always use more Terraform. But <laughs> <laughs> in essence, the, it, the cybersecurity side of it is that it's not just about me freeing up my time as a developer, or as a platform engineer or whatever you want to call yourself, it's that I'm freeing up also the concern that the network module that you're deploying, that I've crafted, has every single thing that needs to be in there from the security standpoint for my posture, right? Yep. All these things so that when you are making tons of different networks, yep. okay, they conform to everything they should have been and I don't need to go and check them. Not only that, if I need to make a security update to it, those changes can propagate outwards to all the existing networks and there we go. We've got to control it all the way in the front. Awesome, your move. Oh, I knew you were gonna go for that. Oh, you did? I fenced it, because I was gonna pull the other one, but I'm like, oh, good, good, that, good job. Uh, I can bring this a bit more unstable. There you go. Okay. Come on, then. It's like okay. next move. Okay, let's see. Those, oh, look at that, here we go. 
Oh, slot. <laughs> oh, that was good. That was good. Oh. I know. Now we're taking the middle blocks out. We took like most of the like side blocks. Hey. Oh, you got it. Wow. Nice. <laughs> oh. Aha. Now we're oh, now we're oh, Okay, cool. I can just take this out. I don't know about that one, man. Oh wow. Yeah. Now it's getting pretty top heavy. But we're gonna keep going for the base. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, and the platform engineering, what would you say is some of the more mature ways you're finding security teams use automation infrastructure as code to have security. Obviously, we're talking about the initial phase of having security already part of it. Mm -hmm. Is that more when security engineering teams are developing their own Terraform modules, or is it mm -hmm. more by uh, using the different options for, say, secret management? Where do you see is the easiest starting point, mm -hmm. A, and how do you see people do easiest that? Easiest starting point, interesting. The easiest starting point is absolutely what we've mentioned there is you get to it every time you build a module that gets reused, you get to invest in the exact standards that you want. Yep. The second side of this, which honestly sometimes will come first because people won't think of modularity at first, is policy as code. Yep. And that's using something like Sentinel or OPA to say, okay, when we get new infrastructure's code in, let's look through it and make sure that the bucket's not left open, right? Yep. The servers don't have SSH access enabled, or the security rules only conform to the particular CIDR blocks that we want. And let's just make sure we check that every single time. Yep. And if you haven't invested in reusable code yet, you at least have those guardrails. And it can also be simple stuff like no Friday deploys, like yep. different things like that. Oh, no Friday deploys, I like that. And my team actually has that set on across like our entire account. Yeah, really? Friday, so yeah. there's, no, there's no deployments on Friday? Yeah, yeah no. So sometimes we'll bypass it, but, but for course. the most part. <laughs> for the most part. So you don't want to go on a Friday 5 p.m. deployment yeah. free yeah, yeah. at that and point. Then, for sure. yeah, fair. Now that we've spoken about the maturity, the different kind of roles, mm -hmm. where do you see as... Is it almost, my, uh, no, sorry, never mind. Sorry. Uh, you're good. There you oh, go. wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. Oh. Hell. Oh, that was... Look at that. Oh, that's cursed. You should not touch that one. Yeah, I'm like, I, I have to. Actually, if you make it collapse, you lose. Actually, you should certainly go for that one. Yeah, it's going to collapse either way, I think. I okay, feel so like... does that have I1? Is that what that means? You uh, would. Oh. Have. But no, I think I have an opportunity. I don't even know if there's any. Oh, actually, I can be really easy here. There we go. Uh, <laughs> oh. Damn you. Oh. The table is taken. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. I'm gonna try and get this one out. Oh, oh, that one's loose too. Oh, wow. Cool. Okay, now I think- This, this, is, the mo this is the moment where it's gonna happen, I think. Yeah, I think the only other one is up here. This is the only other- Oh, well, these are like low-hanging fruit. Yes. Okay. I'm here. here. <laughs> <laughs> I think this might be it. No, I think I'll just take that out. I'll I'll... So now we're doing the like- Are we just taking the top off? Yeah, now we're just taking the top because, because now we're at that- are we really going to just do What happens if we just keep deconstructing it from the top? Or we just keep going this way, right? Like eventually we're going to just detail because I don't think there's any other one. I, I, I would think that there would be a rule against this. <laughs> Otherwise it would never end. Now that we define self-service, it could be complex as yes. the complexity of these rules. Yeah. I am happy to call that this is going to fall at this point in time, but this is your move. You're going to oh, have the honors of... So here we go. Yeah, okay. Well, Go ahead and start doing that. And so, wait, shouldn't I take away one though? Oh, yeah. Actually, okay. you know what? We'll put one in for credit. Then I'll go. Yeah, okay, fair. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, it's still pretty unstable. Here we go. We're going to just. Oh, look at that, that. That worked. Look at that. That definitely worked. Wow. Look at that. Oh. That was like. I should get like a teapot for that. That's yeah. That's why I teapot. You clearly have done this before for sure. Uh, so are you just flicking it? Yeah, so it... I just totally just flicked it. That was pure luck that worked. Well, well. All right, there it is. I'm undefeated in Django. Yes. 1-0 stand... lifetime record. Is it your first hashing conf, by the way? No, oh, this is fourth, third, fourth. Oh. Yeah, so I've, I've been in Apache for coming up on 40 years here pretty soon. So oh, wow. Quite a while. Do you feel like the kind of audience that you're seeing in the maturity and all of that, how, how have you seen it being different between the first one and now that you're on the fourth one now? That is, that's always interesting. The more any of the tech companies to me get further, right? Four years ago, a lot more frontline engineers are obviously a lot more plugged in. And, but as we go further, the more we get more of a mix of tech decision maker, right? 
customer C-suite, because obviously we get more customers, right? We get more people making decisions. Yep. We need to understand what exactly the engineers are trying to champion upwards. Yep. So we start getting the pressure from both sides. Oh, leadership wants to see because they've heard of it. Engineers still want it. As a result, the audiences that we see start becoming more and more of, the, of a diverse mix of the entire company that tech stack in a way. Yeah. So I guess I'm also thinking about people who are looking to attend probably the next one. Yeah. Would that be more for people who are in the infra, security, CIO, CTOs, or who would you put so, that to uh, piggyback off your previous question, actually, this is the first year we've had an entire business track of talks. Uh, so that's how much like how much more audience started changing. But we also have a third cloud engineering track as well. So we just continue to grow and, and add those outwards. So this year we have five different tracks. We have two cloud engineering tracks, one business track, one education track for specific hands-on work because we have a lot of people coming in that just want to learn the space, and then a hallway track for community members and a lot of other people with lightning talk ideas. So the reality is we're only in all the directions, yep. new people to the system, people that are mature, frontline users, and then of course the business decision makers. It's really not anyone who can't get something out of it. And also because most of the security tracks are in there as well as the cloud engineering ones. So most most of security conversations are also in that cloud engineering piece and mm -hmm. the business piece as well. Yep. Yeah, there's a lot of big mix. I will say that for this particular Hajikom, to the day one is very infrastructure focused and day two is going to be very security, security focused. Focus. Mm -hmm. So quite an integral part then. Is there a favorite thing you look forward to at Hajikom now that you win to four? So like the stereotypical things like, oh, the network, you know, to the people, which sounds... You sound so excited. Like but it's true <laughs> because Haji is very it's a remote company, right? So we don't get to see as many of the employees, oh, yeah, many of customers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Or even your colleagues for that matter. As well, because they yeah, more first. Exactly. Well, yeah. So well. you get to see all the people you've been working with, talking about, talking about, yeah, talking about <laughs> uh, in One person. Flag. Oh, you're not as bad in person as I <laughs> thought you were. Uh, <laughs> but that, but of course, getting to see the creativity that from the different use cases that customers or practitioners will come in with. Uh, it can really spark your imagination, either show you the art of the possible or show you that, that the art of the possible you thought was it wasn't what you should be focusing on. There's a lot of learning and tacit knowledge at these conferences that you don't get when you're just online complaining on a GitHub issue. Awesome. And uh, where can people find more information about HashiConf and the work you do are there as mm -hmm. well on and educate themselves on this entire space? Yeah, so two main hubs. Obviously, the first one being the official website, HashiCorp.com, and then the second one being developer.hashicorp.com, and that is our website geared towards all the different tutorials, the engineering ideas, you know, every single... Oh, the, the use the, cases and stuff. Mm -hmm. Use so cases, can, yeah. yeah. That one's very geared towards, like, the hands-on, how do I get this done, but also the architectural, what does this look like from a high-level perspective. And yeah. how does it integrate with the cloud provider? Yep. And yeah, how to set it up with all the different providers and the like. So, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. And, uh, dude, thank you so much for coming yeah. on the show as well and sharing all that with us. And uh, We weren't even playing it right for the first time. Yeah, I guess the, so. clearly the new rules are still broken by yeah. my one. <laughs> but I appreciate coming over. Yeah, thank so much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening or watching this episode of Cloud Security Podcast. We have been running for the past five years, so I'm sure we haven't covered everything cloud security yet. And if there's a particular cloud security topic that we can cover for you in an interview format on Cloud Security Podcast or make a training video on tutorials on Cloud Security Bootcamp, definitely reach out to us on info at cloudsecuritypodcast.gv. By the way, if you're interested in AI and cybersecurity, as many cybersecurity leaders are, you might be interested in our system AI cybersecurity podcast, which I run with former CSO of Robinhood, Caleb Seema, where we talk about everything AI and cybersecurity. How can organizations deal with cybersecurity on AI systems, AI platforms, whatever AI has to bring next as an evolution of chat, GPT, and everything else continues. If you have any other suggestions, definitely drop them on info at cloudsecuritypodcast.gv. I'll drop that in the description and the show notes as well so you can reach out to us easily. Otherwise, I will see you in the next episode. Peace.